All right. So welcome to my talk here, guys. Thanks for showing up in the afternoon. Appreciate it on the last day of the conference, especially. Uh, so the title of the talk here is that Kubernetes runs anywhere, but does your data. And my name is Jared Watts. I'm a maintainer on a project called Rook, and I'm also a founding engineer at a startup called Upbound. So, you know, as you already got from the title of the talk, Kubernetes runs everywhere. And it's, it's pretty amazing, actually, what got accomplished to make that happen. So, you know, in terms of container orchestrators, Kubernetes is the, you know, it's the de facto CO. It's the lingua franca, right? Um, it's really, really is supported by everyone now. It runs in all, all the cloud providers, um, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, DigitalOcean, all those guys. Uh, you can run it on bare metal. Uh, on-premise, hybrid environments. Uh, Kubernetes really runs everywhere, even by a uh, you know, developer laptop, which is what I'm going to be using showing some demos later on here. So even more important than that, though, that Kubernetes itself runs anywhere, it also allows all of your apps to run anywhere, too. You can deploy your apps to any of these environments that we just talked about. And so what that means is that applications can be portable. And so why is portability important, though? So a portable solution, as we kind of talked about, can be run in diverse environments. It can be run anywhere. But what that gives us, though, is the power of choice. So if you have an application that's portable, can run anywhere, then at deployment time, or when you want to get that application running somewhere, you're able to take advantage of the best environment for the job at that point. So you can do things like for cost, you can optimize, go the cheapest route, or you can go for you know, the best quality of service. Maybe some environments uh, have some particular features that you're depending on, and you have to go to certain environments that way. Um, you know, Multi-cloud stuff is getting pretty interesting as well, where you, know, you can have some resiliency. If you deploy your app across multiple environments, multiple clouds, you know, if one major outage happens, happens in, say, Amazon, but you're also deployed in Google, then you, know, you have resiliency against that. Uh, and there's also interesting things like compliance. You know, certain governments have certain requirements for where data can be stored, and so that can influence you know, your choice of where you're going to deploy your application. So you know, how did Kubernetes do that, though? How did Kubernetes enable this uh, incredibly portable application deployment ability? So what it did is it defined a common set of abstractions and primitives for, uh, that kind of capture application deployment concepts. So things like pods, services, um, deployments, all the, what those really are doing are capturing in an abstract way what it means to deploy an application. So a pod is a pod is a pod anywhere you're going to go, right? If you want to deploy your application somewhere like uh, in one of the cloud providers, that pod, you, can, you have the same expectation that your app is going to run the same way no matter where it's being deployed. So it brings up this concept of, you know, right one, white, excuse me, write once, run many, where you write a single manifest, single resource, the YAML file, let's say, and that one YAML file unchanged should be able to run anywhere Kubernetes runs. Uh, and then that gives the developers a bit more freedom to focus only on their application and not worry about the, the details of the environment that that application is going to get deployed into. They've written the manifest once, and it will run many, time, many places. So in addition to the uh, abstractions for um, application deployment concepts, there's also some storage abstractions that Kubernetes has defined. Because um, <clears throat> real, so real-world applications, they're stateful. They need to persist, persist their data somewhere, right? Um, you know, the abstractions that Kubernetes has defined are incredibly useful for helping um, you know, kind of abstract these, storages, uh, these concepts of storage. And we have things like persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. Uh, storage classes is another one. You know, there's plugins. I think the talk just before this one was about CSI, so if you were there for that, you, you learned a little bit about the evolution of where volume plugins are going, uh, industry-wide, that is. But basically, all of these different storage abstractions help support the portability of stateful applications. So let's go into a little bit more detail about what those abstractions are, right? So a persistent volume, uh, PV and PVCs, um, storage for applications is normalized on this concept of a volume. So if you have a pod and it has a storage requirement, uh, it's done in an abstract way through a volume, and that volume is independent of the backing storage router, where that storage is actually coming from. So a pod could have 
a volume that is maybe being backed by a Google persistent disk or maybe by you know, a Ceph uh, Redux block device. It's to, the volume is the abstract concept. That's very powerful because then that enables the application to not have to worry about where the storage is coming from. It's, it says, I need storage, give me a volume, I don't care where it comes from necessarily. Uh, that definitely enables portability. So storage classes, that's another abstraction in Kubernetes for storage. And you can think of those as blueprints that uh, abstract away the details of how a particular storage request is going to get fulfilled. So um, these are normally defined by administrators. So an administrator who has set up uh, details of the storage in the cluster, um, you know, they'll kind of fill in the details about how storage of requests will be fulfilled, you know, where this storage is going to come from. And there's different sort of uh, parameters that you can get from those as well, such as, A, you know, the provider of the storage, where is it going to come from? But then you have other things too, like the, um, the quality of service, uh, different policies for backup, um, you know, various parameters for this storage that kind of define where it's going to be uh, fulfilled from. And the really, really good thing about storage classes in particular is that those lay the foundation for uh, dynamic volume provisioning in Kubernetes. So I'm not sure um, you know, how uh, the experience in this room is with Kubernetes versions going a little bit further back, but if any of you all remember before dynamic provisioning was a thing, and uh, you could only do static provisioning of volumes. Um, dynamic provisioning goes very far beyond that, because with static provisioning only, Basically, you ended up with uh, an administrator having to manually create some storage somewhere from wherever the backing storage is, probably somewhere external to the Kubernetes cluster, right? And then they would have to go in Kubernetes and manually create a persistent volume that mirrors or represents that storage that they manually created, um, which is kind of a pain in the butt, right? You have a human getting in the way or having to come into the process of providing storage to your application pods. So with dynamic provisioning, you know, it's, that takes away that step where on demand you can have an application or a pod that's saying, I need storage, and then programmatically from running code in the cluster, that storage request will be provisioned, fulfilled, you know, mounted, attached, all those sort of things so that no human has to get in the way of an application getting its storage. And uh, then the final abstraction here is volume plugins, which is the, the means by which uh, external storage um, solutions can be integrated in, oh, throwing stickers around. Oh, that reminds me, we do have a bunch of stickers up here if you want any at the end. Um, so you know, that's the means by which uh, these uh, external storage solutions can get integrated into Kubernetes. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that these volume plugins may uh, enable that integration, but it doesn't solve the deploying that storage solution or managing that storage solution. That's kind of an exercise left up to the admin. Um, and you also get into situations here where the applications are going to end up relying on provider, particular cloud provider specific uh, managed services like Google Persistent Disk and Amazon EBS and things like that. So let's talk a bit real quick about these abstractions that exist in Kubernetes that and, you know, have some aspects of enab enabling portability. Let's talk about where they fall short. So one thing is that the focus is really on the consumption side of storage. It's not on the provider side of storage. So it's really dealing with when an application needs storage, needs to consume it, let's get that request fulfilled, and it's doing a great job of that. But it doesn't really have a strong story for what's happening on getting that storage to exist in the first place. Say you have a blank Kubernetes cluster with nothing in it, you know, where's the storage going to come from? <clears throat> well, something's got to get set up for that, right? And uh, there's nothing really that kind of enables that very, very easily in Kubernetes right now. So these uh, the external storage solutions that applications are relying on, they need to be accessible. Somebody's got to deploy them. Somebody's got to manage them. And that creates a burden. Now also, we talked earlier about how uh, storage in Kubernetes is normalized on the concept of a volume, but not all data behaves like a volume. You know, there are many data-intensive workloads uh, that you may want to run in Kubernetes, and they have needs for a higher level of storage than just a, a volume. Uh, things like databases, key value stores, caches, message queues, um, all these different types of storage that applications rely on. There's no real abstraction of those right now that defines or describes the need for that type of storage. It's basically just volumes. 
So what you end up with, once again, is that a lot of applications end up relying on proprietary cloud provider managed services. Uh, a good example here is um, you know, Amazon's uh, relational database service, RDS. And so when you're taking a specific dependency on a specific storage solution, uh, instead of having an abstraction, then you're going to end up with vendor lock-in, right? So a portable storage solution, that's what this talk is supposed to be about, right? So let's start, let's start talking about what that might look like. So we need something that is going to help us make stateful apps be more portable and be as just as environment agnostic as Kubernetes itself, which has done a fantastic job of that. So a couple ideas. What about storage that itself runs inside the Kubernetes cluster? So if you're deploying a storage solution inside Kubernetes, you can start taking advantage of some of those built-in powerful abstractions that it has, like pods and you know, re replica sets, daemon sets, things like that. And another idea, you know, what about expanding, making the set of storage abstract abstractions broader that can start, kind of start describing these data needs that applications have that don't just fit into a volume? So this is kind of a hypothetical here of what a, um, a stateful application may look like if it was truly portable. So we're going to take the uh, example of WordPress. So WordPress is stateful in the, in the sense that it needs a, a to database to store its data. So you know, all the cloud providers, they have <coughs> their version of a managed database service, as we just talked about. Amazon has RDS, and Google, Google has Cloud SQL. So there's solutions out there. Um, you know, so WordPress, describing the application of WordPress in the top right here, and then describing its need for data in the bottom right, that could be done in one single YAML file. And so with that one YAML file, we're basically describing our application and how it needs to be deployed, but we're also describing its need for data and how that might be deployed as well in an environment agnostic, portable way. So if in a situation like this, what would happen is that whatever environment you're running in, the need for a database, the general need for a database, will be fulfilled by whatever environment that is. If it's the Cloud SQL or if it's RDS, that, that'll happen. WordPress gets its database. WordPress is portable now. OK, so now we're going to get into how one could build this. So let's go over a couple concepts quickly that <clears throat> I've heard people talking about this week. So they're probably not uh, brand new concepts to a lot of people, but let's go over them anyways. So when we're talking about extending Kubernetes, uh, there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, one of them that is a very powerful concept is uh, custom resource definitions. And so what those enable you to do is to basically uh, you know, teach Kubernetes about a new first class object type. So you know, we have things like pods and config maps, <coughs> things like that. But CRDs allow us to define our own arbitrary types that look just like a pod or you know, just like a, a daemon set, and you know, just like any other first-class API object. Now, since they're uh, API objects, they get persisted in etcd also. So what this does is this, uh, <coughs> these CRDs, they allow a native management experience through kube control. Um, I've been calling it kube cuddle for the longest time, and in the speaker lounge, I overheard somebody saying that um, only noobs call it that, and kube control is the right way to call it. So I'm trying to correct myself now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I will assimilate. Um, so you know, when when you get to be able to start managing, um, you know, arbitrary types or user-defined types in your Kubernetes cluster with the built-in Kubernetes uh, tools, it starts looking like you know a first-class citizen of Kubernetes. Um, you know, that whole very consistent, cohesive experience is a powerful thing. So these CRDs, they don't have any functionality by themselves. They're basically a type declaration of, you know, this is a type, and these are the type of the properties that belong on it, but it doesn't have logic or features inside of it itself. But with those types, we can define these abstractions we've been talking about here. So this is what a CRD declaration looks like. Um, you know, in, in YAML, you're basically saying that this is a custom resource definition. You give it your API group information, you know, what uh, group it belongs to, the version of it. Uh, and that what we're looking at here is a, a, the kind of a database. So this is what it would look like to define a sort of an abstract portable concept of a database. Now, the other way that we extend Kubernetes is through a concept called operators. Um, CoreOS, I think it was yesterday morning, talked about their new operator SDK, 
<laughs> and they're actually, um, it's, at least to my knowledge, the ones that first came up with this operator pattern or started evangelizing it. And it's, it's really, really, really powerful. Where, you know, an operator is a special type of controller, a Kubernetes controller that we're all familiar with, like a node controller, pod controller, things like that. But what it does is that it codifies the domain expertise or subject matter expertise that it takes to run a complicated application, um, especially over time, too. You know, not just the initial deployments of it, but also the management of it, too. So basically, um, you know, any actions that a uh, human would need to do to manage a cluster, you can automate that with operators so that you know, the software will do this for you. And one of the um, examples that really made me personally see the power of operators was uh, the Prometheus operator, because I, wanted, uh, I had a need for um, you know, monitoring in my cluster, and I don't personally know how to set up Prometheus, but with a cube control, create the operator, and you know, cube control, create Prometheus, without really, no, as myself, having no idea of how the software is going to get managed uh, and deployed underneath the covers, the Prometheus operator did it for me. So it allows users to start using or consuming software systems that they don't need, you know, without the operational experience to manage it. So let software do the job, right? So the, the real way that operators work is through a control loop, just like any other controller. So what they do is they sit in the loop, and they'll watch for events on the CRDs that you've defined, like a create a database or update a database. And they also watch for changes to the cluster itself. So the core part here <clears throat> is that they'll reconcile the user's desired state with what the actual state in the cluster is. So for instance, you, know, you have an actual state is no database, but the user's desired state is yes, please, database. It'll reconcile the two and make that you know, a reality. And it does that through a kind of a three-step process. <clears throat> One is observe, you know, first discover what the actual state of the cluster is. And then analyze, determine the differences between the actual state of the cluster and what the user's desired state is, and then act on that. You know, perform operations or do you know, whatever calls you need to do to uh, make sure that the desired state is made a reality. So continuously in this loop, the operator will be driving towards that desired state. And as we kind of alluded to earlier, <clears throat> you know, once a software system gets deployed, it's got to be managed. Think about day two operations. You've deployed it, but on day two, you've got to support it, right? So there's a whole bunch of things that operators can do that we can teach them to do and automate with software, like ensuring they're healthy, um, scaling it, you know, making sure that if there's a failover, or sorry, a failure, you can you know, fail components over, <coughs> heal the, the system, backups, restorations, uh, one of them that's particularly interesting to me is upgrades, or across versions of a piece of software, you may have breaking changes, or you may need to do some sort of migration, right? And the operator can do that for you, as opposed to having to have a human go in there and you know, do things manually. Let's make software do it. So just let the operator manage it. It's very powerful to have automation doing things for you. And now a key aspect uh, when we're getting down into the code of what an operator would look like is uh, to, to be able to talk to the Kubernetes API. You can't do much in a Kubernetes cluster without being able to talk to the API server and um, you know, making requests, performing operations, getting information. Uh, so the way that's done in, uh, in operators often is uh, with a client set. And so a client set is, uh, is a collection of various clients that can talk to the Kubernetes API to get work done. And so from your controller, uh, your operator, and your Go code, you, you would have a client set there that you can start making these calls with. So you can see some examples at the bottom here where we have a client set, and then we're asking for you know, the, core, uh, the core API, v1 of the core API. You know, I want to do something with pods, so I call the pods function in the default namespace, and I want to list these pods. So programmatically, with code, you in a client set here, you're getting all the pods in the system, and that's part of that observing uh, step of operators of, I need to know what the system's doing before I can analyze it and start making changes. You know, similarly, we can uh, do things like in the storage, the V1 of the storage API, we can create storage classes. So all of this we can do programmatically from our operators. So it's not only important for you know, discovering system state, it's also important for um, you know, performing operations to drive towards that desired state in the cluster. 
Uh, another key aspect of, um, of operators here is uh, informers. So, an informer, so we, want, we have the need in, in our operators to be able to tell when an event happens. Uh, so the way we could do that, one way, a naive way, would just be to keep asking the API server, hey, is there an object I care about? You know, ask again, ask again. But if you're pulling the API server like that, if everyone's doing that in the cluster, especially considering how many components can run in a Kubernetes cluster at once, uh, that gets expensive really quickly. And it's incredibly wasteful, too. So an informer is a way to uh, efficiently watch for events from the API server and get a notification about it. Informers also have a very nice property of caching objects locally, so that if you have a client that's asking for, hey, give me the pods, give me the pods, give me the pods, <coughs> it won't continue to hit the API server with that request. It'll uh, fulfill that request from its local in-memory cache of objects to be even more performant. And there's also a concept of shared performers, where if you have multiple controllers all running in the same process, they can share information in an efficient way. Um, so we're just going to move through this pretty quickly. So you know, in your operator, you know, to start implementing these systems here, uh, to be you know, creating an informer, you need a source of where the information is going to be. Or to, you know, that's the Kubernetes API server. You say, hey, I want to I want to learn about pods. Every 30 seconds, I want you to refresh that cache for me so it doesn't go too stale. But here's the important part to me: when you're asking for events on uh, objects in the Kubernetes API server, you're also giving it these function handlers, uh, these function pointers to handlers to say, OK, here's a function I want you to call when some, a pod has been added. Here's one for update, and here's one for delete. So basically, we're defining behavior that we want to have happen when uh, events happen in the system that we care about. And the last part here is about uh, event triggers. So you want your when you're watching for events, you want it to be level-driven, not edge-driven. So what that means is that you can't always assume that you're going to see when a transition happens. You have to make decisions on level-driven, not edge-driven, for when you see a state in the system. Uh, you may have missed when that transition happened, but perform the reconciliation. Do the operation anyways when you see uh, the state of the system in a state that you care about. All right, so back to the beginning here, finally. Running your data anywhere. So we've kind of talked through a bunch of concepts here, and this is pulling it all together. So by extending Kubernetes, we can start defining these new, useful, portable abstractions. So a, you know, users and apps, uh, they can describe what they're, not only how they want to be deployed, but also what their storage needs are as well. And as soon as we've described both the storage needs and the deployment needs of an application, what we're, what we're getting there is true portability of, I can now take this application, even though it's stateful and has a requirement for storage, it can go anywhere now. And then the, the final part there is how operators can make that desire for data just happen <coughs> because of their you know, automated uh, domain knowledge of how to operate, uh, how, excuse me, how to run a cluster. And it does that in two ways, with either deploying storage solutions into your Kubernetes cluster or having the smarts to talk to whatever cloud provider you're running in and getting the managed services up and running and provisioned. All right, so now I'm going to show a, a few things here. So we were, in this talk here, we were talking about um, you know, how we can have portable storage solutions or how we can bring storage into Kubernetes, the cluster itself, so it can run bare metal, hybrid solutions, cloud providers, all that sort of stuff. So we're going to show a few operators from the Rook project um, that I mentioned I'm a maintainer on. And we're going to show how a lot of different storage can come right on into our Kubernetes cluster. And it's on my laptop right now, but this could be bare metal, this could be um, cloud provider, doesn't matter. So I'm going to use some aliases when I'm typing, and I apologize for that, but it makes for less mistakes, I hope. So right now, Ceph is a distributed storage system that Rook supports, and I'm creating an operator for it. I'm also going to do the same thing for CockroachDB. And I'm also going to do the same thing for Minio. And so what we're going to see here is, uh, and I hope that's big enough, but there's a lot of information to kind of fit on the screen here. So we'll make it, make it work. But what we're, what we're showing here is that I've deployed three different types of operators out to this Kubernetes cluster, one for Minio, CockroachDB, and one for Ceph. And so these operators are sitting there. They've defined their own custom resources. 
uh, that capture the concepts of what a Ceph cluster is and how it's deployed, what a CockroachDB database is, how it's deployed. All those sort of things are captured by these operators, and they're waiting there for us to, to do something useful. So now that we have created these, these three different operators, let's go ahead and start making some storage, too. So I'm asking the Ceph operator now to create a cluster, uh, a Ceph cluster specifically. So uh, when I created that using kube control, it created an API, uh, an instance of our custom resource definition Ceph cluster in, with uh, the Kubernetes API server, which triggered an event to our Ceph operator, which says, oh, cool, somebody's added a Ceph cluster. So I'm going to go ahead, and I know the specifics. I've got the domain expertise of what it means to be a Ceph cluster with distributed storage, so I'm going to make that happen. So we see here, multiple pods start coming up, and uh, you know, start the operator is going through the steps that it takes to build a Ceph cluster for us directly in Kubernetes. Oops. We are also going to do the same thing, or similar thing, for CockroachDB. And we're going to do the same thing for Minio, too. And we'll go back over to this view here. So very similar to Ceph, we asked uh, for an instance of a CockroachDB database. We asked for an instance of a Minio objects uh, server. And those operators knew what we were asking for, because they got an event on it to add, to add that to the cluster. And then they're using client sets uh, and the Kubernetes API to build these storage solutions for us directly in our cluster. So it looks like most all that's running now. So we have Ceph, we've got Cockroach, we've got Minio. Um, let's use this stuff now that we've actually got a storage solution deployed in a portable way in our Kubernetes cluster. Let's, uh, let's use it. I'm going to start doing some copy pasting here, sorry. This is not meant to be readable. Uh, what do I want to do? So uh, I've defined a storage class for, for uh, the Ceph provisioner, <coughs> so that when an application uh, requests uh, storage, then that can be fulfilled, because the storage class is the, uh, the, the blueprint right, for, that defines how a storage request can be fulfilled. And then I've also gone ahead and deployed two other, uh, a stateful application. I've deployed WordPress, and I've deployed a database underneath WordPress to serve as this persistent storage. That WordPress, uh, sorry, the MySQL database that's going to uh, handle the storage for WordPress is actually going to be served underneath by that Ceph distributed storage system that we deployed out to the cluster. So it looks like those are running now. And let's do something similar for CockroachDB and Menio also. Oh, yeah, this guy. Yes, so let's do something useful for Cockroach. So I'm got, what I've done here now is I've gone ahead and created a uh, kind of a load generation app for Cockroach. It's going to do a lot of random writes and kind of you know, benchmark and things like that. So we're kind of looking at its logs here of uh, all the writes that it's doing to the database, to the CockroachDB database. So we know that the, the CockroachDB instance that we deployed is up and running and functional, and you can do writes and things on it. And we can also do a select to look at the data, random data that it's writing to it also. Uh, but let's also take a look at Minio, too. So this is just asking for you know, what URL uh, you know, IP address did uh, the Minio object server end up on? Oops, yeah, there we go. And um, and so now we're seeing the the Minio object server, uh, you know, login page up and running. And now we have uh, you know an S3 compatible object server up and running in our Kubernetes cluster. So let's just create a bucket. And let's uh, add some files to it from the desktop. Oh, I don't want those PDFs. And so, you know, in our cluster, we have object storage that's up and running in a portable way, and we can start using it for, you know, storing files in our object server. 
Um, we have, in addition to that, we've got you know, a database instance up and running that we could consume. Uh, you know, Cockroach DB. We also have a distributed storage cluster of Ceph running that also services block storage, file storage, object storage. So basically, what we have here is, you know, in a portable way, we have a set of operators and a set of, um, you know, custom resources that have extended Kubernetes to be able to bring storage that your applications require into Kubernetes in a portable way anywhere you deploy. Cloud providers, on-premise, laptop, whatever. Right, so let's go back to the sides real quick. All right, and that is all. So thank you very much for attending this talk today. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm... Oh yeah, I, I think I have one here. I don't know if it's. On the, yeah. There you go. Could you maybe show us really quick uh, how you uh, do the configuration for where the data should be stored, uh, especially in Ceph, you have uh, the possibility to have an SSD cache uh, on the very top of it. So uh, what's, uh, how does Rook, uh, how do I configure in Rook that it should be uh, uh, saved on SSD? And how do I configure the flash times and uh, things like that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, you are clearly familiar with Ceph. You've used it before, obviously. Um, you know, and, and as you're mentioning there, you know, Ceph has this ability to uh, kind of define the topology of your storage cluster of, um, of you know, where data lives, uh, you know, classes of it to put, you know, certain information on, um, you know, faster NVMe, SSD devices, things like that, right? So... In the example demo we had here, just running on my laptop, you know, I don't have uh, a set of SSDs and NVMEs and stuff to use like that. So um, I'll make this bigger, don't worry. And let's try to bring it up as quick as possible. There we go. So uh, in this is this is what a, a, this uh, Ceph cluster CRD is right here defined. And so this is where you get some of those configuration options to start saying how you want the operator to deploy the, store, the Ceph storage for you. So this particular field here, like metadata device, this is where you would say, hey, this is my SSD that I want you to use. Um, and then you can start defining uh, you know, other aspects of the cluster, like um, you know, what particular nodes you want it running on, what devices those are, you know, the spinning platter devices, where you want data to end up. Uh, if you want it to use file store, blue store, um, you know, a bunch of various constructs of how you want to deploy the storage. Now, since these are some, some of these are abstractions over what Ceph provides, uh, there's going to be some simplicity or some things that Ceph may do that you know isn't necessarily directly supported by Rook, but uh, you do have the avail availability to specify how the storage resources in your cluster, you know, what hard drives and devices you have in your cluster, should be used by Ceph. And now it's important to note too that with Rook, uh, since you know, there's more support than just for Ceph, this can be done in a common way now because all storage providers need to know what storage they can use in the cluster to make something useful, right? Um, like even Minio, CockroachDB. So in a consistent way, you know, using Rook and these operators, you can say, hey, I want you to use these devices for what the specific storage solution on top of it is, be that Cockroach or Nexenta or Ceph or whatever it may be. Yes. What do you do if you have already existing set cluster and you want to use it in different uh, Kubernetes clusters? Yeah, so the, the question was, you know, what do you do if you have an existing Ceph cluster and you want to use it in different Ceph clusters? Um, so there isn't there isn't a specific you know, migration path or you know, full, uh, support with Rook to bring it into Kubernetes if you already have it existing. There are things you can do, such as you know, set up replication with the uh, um, Ceph cluster that you've created in Kubernetes and start replicating the data over, or snapshots and move them over, things like that. But there's not a specific way that that's supported. So it's you know, mostly for starting with new Ceph clusters. I'm not sure if I follow that. If so, you have three, for example, uh, Kubernetes cluster. Oh, it, like in the demo I was doing here? Uh, no, no, no. 
Oh, oh, in your hypothetical. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's my question. Yeah. For example, if I have three Kubernetes clusters, and uh, so I need three different set clusters to be running in the three Kubernetes clusters, right? Uh, yeah, I believe uh, like that gets into you know federation between the Kubernetes clusters, and that's kind of a hot topic right now, actually, with you know this whole uh, you know, multi-cloud story too. And so there's actually some some thing, you know thinking right now that's being done on that to how to make that management story of multi-clusters, multiple clouds, look more like managing a single cluster. And so you know they don't have a story for or an ex, you know a solution for that right now. But that's actually something that we're thinking of and working on right now to support that better. That's a good question. Let me see a time check. I think that's uh, all the time we have here. So thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it.